Would you join me in prayer? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our salvation. Amen. I need to know something before I start sharing my Advent meditation this morning. How many of you, I need a, a show of hands, how many of you are actually awake? How many of you are actually awake? Okay, just checking. I mean, we've been hearing a lot of words here about waking up, right? I just need to know, because this information seems particularly important to Jesus. He wants to know if we're awake, right? Are your eyes open? Well, that's a good start. <laughs> I actually know there are creatures in this world whose eyes are open and are still asleep. Are you paying attention? Are you watching and aware of what is happening around you? Are you taking care of yourself and the world around you? In the words of the old camp song, are you alive, awake, alert, enthusiastic? Does anyone know that song? They didn't know it at night. I'm awake, alive, alert, enthusiastic. Maybe that was one that my family made up. I don't know. Anyway, you keep singing it till you finally wake up. As we launch into Advent today, Isaiah tells us to open our eyes, our ears, and our minds. He says that God is coming and that we should be praying for God's arrival. It's very important. He says, like a potter, God's hands will shape us into the people that God longs for us to be. In the apocalyptic passage from Mark, Jesus tells us that God will be coming very soon, breaking the cycles of days and seasons and everything we need to know, everything we knew the way it was before. Mark proclaims that God will come when God will come, not when we say, not when someone else tells us, but when God is ready. The farthest star and the smallest blade of grass may not be ready, but God will come when God will come. For Isaiah, our job is to prepare through prayer. For Mark, we are told to stay awake, to be faithful as though we're already standing in the presence of God, the one who is coming in the name of the Lord. Don't be deceived in this season by Christmas music and all the decorations all around us because we don't begin Advent in comfort and joy. Sorry to tell you. We begin in despair and desperation. Sometimes you just want to kill the messenger, right? We begin in darkness. The arrival of the light of the world is 21 days and a few hours away. This is a message for the spiritually mature, delivered at a time when we really want to hold on to, to cuddle, and to rock the baby in the manger, or better yet, right, Greg and Gary, your grandchild. <laughs> so you just want to do that. So if you're coming to church today for the first time, or maybe for a while, you haven't been here, welcome to the wild ride of Advent. And to everybody else, the same applies. Hold on to your faith. Whether you have a lot of it or a little of it, it will be shaken. It'll be shaken like a glass snow globe before our ride is over. To quote Dorothy, we are not in Kansas anymore. To quote Santa, this doesn't look at all like the North Pole. And to quote Jesus, wake up, we're starting over. You know, we just got through the last year of the church year and we have to start again somewhere and this is the place, this is the day. To get to Christmas, we must go through Isaiah and Mark and we go through the land of John the Baptizer which has a river running right beside it. It is a barren land where one must look hard to find desert flowers. Today alone, the prophet Isaiah speaks of destruction, and Jesus speaks of the end of the world as we know it. According to the ancient scriptures, humankind has reached the end of its rope, and all of our schemes and all of our nice ideas for extricating ourselves from the traps that we have set for ourselves have come to nothing. We cannot save ourselves. Without God, there will be no saving going on. This moment reminds me actually of something that happened many, many years ago. About 30 years ago, a couple came to me from outside our church, which at that time I was at North Church. Their marriage was in trouble. You name it, and they had it going on between them. After our second session, they asked me 
if there was any hope for their marriage. I breathed deep, I counted to 10, and I answered sincerely, only God can save your marriage. They canceled the next session. I didn't hear from them for quite some time, so I called them to ask if they were okay and what had happened, and they responded. You told us that only God could save our marriage, and we don't believe in God, so we're getting a divorce. Wow. <laughs> I thought God saving their marriage would be a good thing, but they didn't see it that way. Friends, when we read that only God can save us, let's see that as a good thing, okay? Not, not something that we should run away from. It means we just have to stay awake to pay attention to the signs that God will give us in this season and in our lives, and then ask for help to get there with God. This season of Ad Advent strips us down to bare essentials and forces us to begin again. Is it any wonder that we want to get to our Christmas carols and tidings of good joy? By the end of our Advent boot camp, we will find ourselves in ready to embrace Christmas with everything in us a place where hope will come out of seeming hopelessness, where yearnings for God have brought us face to face, with, face to face with our maker and where new songs are sung in a world that has gone off the rails. Isaiah kicks off the season with a prayer, spoken by a people who are powerless and under oppression. Isaiah, Isaiah's prayer lifts up two main features of Advent hope. On the one hand, he starts with this deep sense of desperation about the situation that he's in that is out of control. On the other hand, he has this bold and confident trust in God, this belief that God will give the voice that's needed and will intervene to make the world a peace-able world, a prophetic present world. Life without God is unbearable in Isaiah's mind. That is the present tense of his prophecy. Moreover, life with God can be completely transformed, which is the urgent hope of a future tense. While Isaiah points out the fire and destruction growing out of the unfaithfulness of God's people, he pivots on one word. This whole passage in Isaiah pivots on one word, what we taught, which is the Hebrew for nevertheless. Nevertheless. The prophet introduces us to God in three staggering indicatives. In spite of all sins and failings, God is found in the nevertheless. He says, you are our father, you are our potter, and we are the work of your hands. A potter and a father, a creator of all. Isaiah cries to God not to destroy all of the people who have been unfaithful. Instead, he says, please, Lord, do not hold our sins against us forever. Wow. You reach a point where things have gotten so desperate that you just ask God not to do it forever, right? We, you can hold the sins against us, Lord, but, but not forever. In Mark's 13th chapter, Jesus shifts the narrative of earlier chapters and verses in which he's been healing and teaching and preaching to paying attention to watching out and to waking up. This shift is dramatic, and you'll see it as the year unfolds. The shift is dramatic. It's mythic in proportion. It's apocalyptic. At the same time, it is subtle, which you don't usually associate with apocalyptic things, right? Like Isaiah, the conversation pivots on one word. While Isaiah's pivotal word was nevertheless, Jesus' pivotal word in Mark is see. See, Jesus says the signs are coming that the end is at hand. While there is no way to anticipate that day or when that time comes, you can keep your eyes open, he says. You can see. Throughout the Gospel of Mark, the author uses the word blepo to mean eye opening or someone ready for prime time faith. Blepo means you're watching out. It is a kind of spiritual discernment where you are and what you see. Blepo protects a disciple from being misled by external things. But suddenly and subtly, the verb changes to Gregorio, a verb he uses once for see. 
And it means this, to see something different so that you act in a new way. So follow this. Now the disciples of Christ must not simply stand and see and watch for the return of the Lord, but they actually must act a completely different way from having seen what they've seen. What was spiritual perception in Bleppo must now lead directly to faithful behavior in Gregorio. In other words, get your act together. That's another way of saying it. How many of us are messing things up in our lives by our own actions? How many of us are angry or out of sorts and just keeping all of the stuff at arm's length from us? How many of us are in a bad space right now, a space that we could move out of if we simply chose Gregorio, if we chose to see something in a new way? Here at the end of Mark's Gospel, Jesus is on the edge of his trial and his crucifixion when he speaks these words. He is not a baby in a manger. He is a man facing the cross. He tells his disciples to stop being babies and start being women and men of faith. He says, wake up, grow up, sober up, step up, turn your life around, get your act together. He's saying what will become some of his last words, which are our first words in this new season. As I stand and deliver this message today, I have to admit to you, I do it with true fear and trembling. From way up in this box, I do so knowing that these words cut right through me and mine, just as they cut through you and yours. I feel like these words are searing truths for every single one of us. They are words we need to hear, but as we all know, sometimes the things we need to hear are not things that we want to hear or like to hear. And they are also words that need to be heard by the whole world around us. It's true. We need a new brand of truth. We need to, in the words of the scriptures, confess our sins, sins that hold us back from one another, sins of racism or anti-Semitism, economic inequality, shrinking, and lack of opportunity for those who are born black or brown or born on the wrong side of the tracks. We need to confess where the divisions are, which keep us from God and from one another. And we need a new brand of truth-telling that grows out of suffering. In the face of all that's wrong, we need to embrace Isaiah at the pivot point. We need to embrace the nevertheless. And we need to see, as Jesus says, in a new way, see that it's time to wake up, but also to get awake in the weary world, to open our eyes, to take in what we see, it starts by looking inside, and only then maybe we'll see what's close at hand and beyond. So it's time to wake up. So if you've been sleeping during the sermon, it's time to wake up. It's time to wake up. It's time to wake up and see. Thanks be to God. Amen.